Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part two of Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry by Dr. R. Swinburne Clymer. Degrees of the Mystic Oriental Rite, Grand Master of the Secret Manuscript. It came to pass when the temple was completed that Solomon hesitated to dedicate it for two reasons. First, on the account of the death of Hiram Abith. Second, on the account of the fact that with the death of the widow's son, the master's word and the secret manner of using it had been lost. Therefore Solomon, in his extremity, called a secret council at low twelve, in the secret crypt under the sectum sectorum. The secret council consisted of Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, Zadok the high priest, Benaiah captain of the guards. After Solomon deployed the loss of Hiram Abith, and with him the master's word and the secret manner of using it, Hiram king of Tyre arose and reminded King Solomon that Nathan the prophet was still alive and might render some assistance in the present calamity. Solomon, therefore, ordered Benaiah, captain of the guards, to search out and bring before him Nathan the prophet. Benaiah, having asserted that Nathan the prophet was at the house of Abiatar, a former high priest under King David, repaired to the place, but found that Nathan had died of old age, but a very short time before his arrival. He thereupon set about to return, and discovering a stranger wandering near the secret crypt, he thereupon took him into his custody and brought him before the secret council. This stranger proved to be Abdomen, a very wise man and a subject of Hiram, king of Tyre. Upon examination, it was found that he had been initiated as an entered apprentice passed to the degree of fellow craft and raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason by Sison, a scribe who had journeyed into the country of the Tyrians, so that the secrets of Masonry proceeded Hiram, king of Tyre, into his own dominions. Abdomen, being a Mason and being recognized as a very learned and crafty man by King Hiram, was at length admitted to the secret council after giving into the hands of King Solomon a manuscript that had been given to him in a wonderful and mysterious manner by an Egyptian during the time he was held in confinement by the secret council. Solomon was so pleased with the manuscript that he then and there admitted Abdomen as a member of the secret council which was then city. Abdomen, in his turn, felt himself so highly honored that he begged, leave, and received permission to journey into the land of Egypt and be initiated into the secrets of the initiates of the Great Pyramid, and in turn promised to journey back into the land of the Israelites and disclose to the secret council what he had learned. Abdomen, was successful in his efforts and the following degrees were instituted to preserve the knowledge which Abdomen gained in the land of Egypt and his journey and initiation in the Great Stone Pyramid. Second, the King's Pioneer. Third, degree of Master of the Secret Cavern. After resting three days at the well of Beersheba, Amini, the singer, the horoscopus and abdomen under the escort of the king's pioneer journeyed by easy stages to Mount Serbel, where the parties took refuge in a natural cave where abdomen received his final instructions before his initiation into the degree of the pyramid. During the course of the journey, Amina disclosed many hidden mysteries to abdomen concerning initiation and why it was impossible to make these disclosures to the multitude in general. 
Among the things which Amini communicated to Adaman on their journey, the following is the most important, for he said, Before appearing on earth, man lived in a spiritual world, similar to the one in which he lives on, leaving the earth, each awaiting his turn in this world to appear on earth, an appearance necessary, a life of trials none can escape. The life anterior which we have all passed through was, so to speak, a life of nothingness, of childbirth, of happiness like that which we enjoy on our exit from the earth. But this happiness cannot be comprehended because it's not accompanied with sensations to prove its sweet reality. Therefore God has deemed fit that we should pass through these successive lives, the first on the globes on which I speak to you, a life unknown, of beatitude, devoid of sensation, the second, the one you enjoy, a life of action, sensation, a painful life placed between the two, to demonstrate through its contrast the sweetness of the third, the life of good and evil, without which we should not be able to appreciate the happy state reserved for us. That the soul is an emanation of deity and in its original essence is all purity, truth and wisdom, is an axiom which the disembodied learn. When the powers of memory are sufficiently awakened to perceive the states of existence anterior to mortal birth. In the paradises of purity and love, so spring up like blossoms in the All-Father's garden of immortal beauty. It is the tendency of the divine nature whose chief attributes are love and wisdom, heat and light, to repeat itself eternally and mirror forth its own perfection in scintillations from itself. These sparks of heavenly fire become souls, and as the effect must share in the nature of the cause, the fire which warms into life also illuminates into light, hence the soul emanations from the divine are all love and heat. While it's the illumination of light which stems ever from the great central sun of being, irradiates all souls with corresponding beams of light, born of love which corresponds to divine heat and warmth, and irradiated with light, which is divine wisdom and truth. The first and most powerful souls repeat the action of the Supreme Originator, gave off emanations from their own being, some higher, some lower, the highest tending upward into spiritual essences, the lowest forming particled matter, the denser emanations following out the creative law, aggregated into suns, satellites, worlds, and each repeating the story of creation. Suns gave birth into systems, and every member of a system became a theater of subordinate states of spiritual or material existence. Earths that have attained to the capacity to support organic life necessarily attract it. Earth demand it. Heaven supplies it. From whence, as the Earths groan for the lordship of superior beings to rule over them, the spirits in the distant Edens hear the whispers of the tempting serpent, the animal principle, the urgent intellect, which appealing to the blessed souls in their distant paradises, fill them with indescribable longings for change, for broader vistas of knowledge, for mightier powers, they would be as the gods and know good and evil. And in this urgent appeal of the earth's for man and this involuntary yearning of the spirit for intellectual knowledge, the union is affected between the two and the spirit becomes precipitated into the realms of matter to undergo a pilgrimage through the probationary states of earth 
and only to regain paradise again by the fulfillment of that pilgrimage. The names of the other four degrees, it is not even lawful for me to state in a public matter, but sufficient for me it is to say that the manner and order to the offices of the Great Pyramid was as follows. The chief or singer, who carries an instrument symbolic of music and two books of Hermes, one of them containing the hymns of the gods and the other the list of the kings. After him comes the horoscopist, observer of the seasons, carrying a palm branch and a timepiece symbolic of astrology. He has to know by heart the four books of Hermes, which treat of astrology, the first of which treats of the order of the plants, the second of the rising and setting of the sun and the moon, and the third and fourth of their movements in their orbits and the aspects of the stars. Then comes the sacred rider, having some, and in his hands a book, an ink bottle, and a reed for writing, according to the manner of the priest. This office has to understand the language of the hieroglyphics, the description of the universe, the courses of the sun, moon, and planets, the divisions of Egypt into 36 districts, the course of the Nile, the sacred ornaments, the holy places, etc. Then comes the stole bearer, who carries the gauge of justice, or measure of the Nile, and a chalice for libations, together with ten volumes containing the sacrifices, the hymns, the prayers, the offerings, and ceremonies of the feast. Finally appears the prophet, carrying in his bosom, but exposed, a pitcher. He is followed by those who carry the bread, as at the marriage of Cana. This prophet, in his position as a keeper of the mysteries, must know by heart the ten volumes which treat of the laws, of the gods, and of all the disciples of the priest, etc., which are outside the 42 volumes. 36 are known by these persons, and the other six, treating of medicine, of the construction of the human frame, of sickness, of mendicament, and of surgical instruments, belong to the postiverse. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses through PayPal or Patreon. Links are in the description. Thank you very much.